Welcome back, everyone. Uh, uh, as we resume, we welcome uh, Professor Muthu Kumar to continue his lecture on physics of charge macromolecules. Uh, over to you, Professor. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me begin uh, by thanking the organizers once again and our able helper, assistant. Mr. Gopi, thank you for your help. And uh, let me also uh, request any questions that you may have based on the last lecture. I know I had lots of conversations with several people. There were lots of questions which I plan to address so everybody can share what those questions were. But in, on top of that, yes, please. Make sure, I will address that. Um, let me reminisce what we did before. I'll address that and if it's not clear enough, Oh, please ask me again. Any other questions? I know I have only an hour and 25 minutes, but I don't have to use it for what I want to say. You know, I want to cater to the questions that you are probably pondering over. So any other questions, please? Okay, maybe then I should ask you questions <laughs> a little later. All right, okay. So what I left with yesterday was this question I gave. A yeah, brief uh, introduction about with a chaotic random coil like polymer without explicitly addressing the role of charges on them. If this polymer were to be neutral polymer, namely neutral means uncharged polymer, and what kind of structure and the shape it might adopt. Right? And there were two basic questions issues, description, descriptors of a large macromolecules for an uncharged polymer, which is um, given in the following way. If I had a chain like this, it has chemistry loaded, and of course there is solvent everywhere. Nothing is existing in a vacuum in terms of this polymer is traveling through decompose. And then what we did was between uh, several monomers, among several monomers we built a distance called Kuhn length. This is Kuhn segment length within which the bond orientation is correlated. Okay, there are maybe there are 10 carbon carbon bonds in one segment. Right? And based upon this, we have many such segments and a number of segments we'll call to be N. This is the number of segments per chain. So these are the parameters N and L, which map to the real degree of polymerization of the polymer. And it's also, this is also mapping to the chemical details of rotation, local rotational barriers, bond length, bond angles, dihedral angles, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, let me write local chemistry which is extremely important as we are going to see today. Local chemistry is extreme. That's how we make the modern or uh, almost the last century of a polymer age. That comes because of the combination of this and this and the physics that I'm going to share with you. These are the two important parameters which are going to capture the chemical details. Since my focus is talk about physical aspects, I do not want to dwell too much into details of chemistry. Therefore, I'm going to parameterize them. The other thing that we did was, all right, I take this polymer chain and then I put it in a yeah, liquid. And let me look at the interaction between one monomer or one segment, right? Let me call this i segment. And then there's another segment, say j to segment. The distance between them is r i j. And then uh, we wanted to know the interaction between them. Since I have solvent molecules in here, everywhere, the interaction between this and this is mediated by not only the chain connectivity, but also once they are brought together at certain distance Rij, the interaction between them is modulated by the interaction between this monomer and this solvent molecule, as well as how this solvent molecule interacts with other solvent molecules. So, so there is a combination of confluence of 
solvent to molecule, solvent molecule interaction, solvent molecule segment interaction, and segment to segment interaction. As a result of this, the potential energy it should be free energy because of all this solvent entropy organization, et cetera. But typically, we call this free potential energy between I to segment and J to segment as a distance between Rij. Uh, this typically has this shape. This is Rij. I'm plotting in terms of uh, angular average linear dimension. It has this shape. And there was a question about uh, this shape. When the distance between those two monomers are far away, there is no interaction because they don't, they don't see it it's out of the range of the interaction. And then there was a question about whether there is a possibility for this energy profile to be purely repulsive. We do that for computer simulations because we are in, inspired by all the advances that we made in hard sphere systems. But our physiological conditions we do not deal with hard sphere systems. I cannot imagine myself made of just marbles, right? You know, hard marbles. Now, that would be terrible. You know, I would not be able to do anything with that, right? So I'm not going to talk about hard sphere interactions in this business. Another day, I'll talk about it because it has very beautiful physics of entropically driven organization. It's just, but that's a different domain altogether, not for our living matter and soft matter. Okay, so I'm not drawing that potential. That doesn't prevent me doing playing in the playground with the hard sphere, hard interactions, etc. to understand fundamental physics. Okay, so then as a consequence of this, okay, so what does that, this mean? This means there is some appropriate distance at which the monomers can attract if the conditions are right and if the temperature is right. And in order to parameterize this, why do I need to parameterize this? Because I have infinite number of problems at my hand. When I say infinite number of problems, because this monomer could be made up of phenyl group, could be or azobenzene, or it could be cyclohexane, it could be methyl, it could be butyl, and the solvent could be cyclohexane or benzene, toluene, whatever. So you have an infinite number of possibilities in terms of chemistry. I don't want to take each problem as a separate problem and and deal with this. I do not want to do this because I don't have capability to do that, right? So I want, I'm driven to make parameterization, right? As a representation of the chemistry. And that is done by composing the second virial coefficient. The second virial coefficient is effect interaction between two segments, drij, one minus e to the beta of u, ij, rij, by KT. And uh, this has a dimension of volume. Uh, let me define this by one over L cubed. L is already a chemical representation. And this, I call this to be a parameter V. It is a parameter. People normally call making analogy with the second variable coefficient of um, collection of atoms or molecules in gas, gas, gaseous state, people will call this to be extruded volume. I shall not do that because as you see, we have lots of interactions in here. It's not extruded volume, but I would call this to be extruded volume parameter. And it's going to be dependent upon temperature and chemistry. Because chemistry gives me my UIJ depends upon the nature of the interaction between this and this, this and this, this and that. This is going to be uh, given this range and, and the depth. And I, I showed you, argued that this parameter as a function of temperature will have something like this. This is a positive, negative, at a high temperature, the repulsive interactions are felt more so as a consequence of this, this integral is dominated by this plus term, that gives me a positive value. At a lower temperature, the attractive interactions are felt, the net attractive interactions are felt. As a consequence of that, the second term is going to dominate with a negative sign. So it's going to be like this. And this is my theta temperature, ideal temperature, where
depends only on Rij for a homopolymer. No, we don't have to do it unless we talk about proteins, intrinsically disordered proteins. When you have sequences, then I and J become variables because along the sequence, I can have a positive charge and a negative charge or uncharged group. Then the specificity of the I and J become, become important. For a particular I and J, then Rij is only a variable difference. Yeah, good question. Thank you, Arun. Okay, so. And now, when V is positive, that means repulsion is more important. That means what when you have a medium of solvent and then monomers are interacting, they're repelling. That means the monomers are going to be away from each other. That means the chain is swollen. Chain is swollen, right? That means the, the solvent is able to penetrate into the polymer chain. And therefore, we call this a good solution because polymer is happily exhibiting its conformation entropy in this solvent medium. So we'll call this to be a good solvent or a good solution. On the other hand, if the temperature is low, the attraction between the segments becomes dominant, and then they'll make a globule like we did the derivation, it'll make a globule. When you make the globule inside this polymer coil, there's not enough solvent molecules. Solvent molecules are kicked out. That means the polymer is being segregated away from the solvent. So we say for the polymer, this is a poor condition. So this is a poor solution. I really don't want to be poor. And if I may digress a little bit, I don't want segregation. I want to be in good condition, right? We want to mix things. Right? So, but this is nomenclature. At a high temperature, we have a good solution. At low temperature, we have poor solution. Okay. Given this, I want to go back to uh, next slide, please. This is the problem I want to do. Right, I have my polymer chain. Uh, we could pick any, pick any one of your favorite polymer chains. And I want to uh, look at the size and shape of this. I talked about more or less a dull polymer in the last lecture, uncharged polymer in an organic solvent because uncharged polymers are not soluble in water, right? But for polymer age making materials, that's okay. But I'm interested in this rich polymer. This is what I wanted to do. And again, uh, there's water, there are lots of sol salt ions, and this is the explorer volume I'm telling you about. So far, whatever I told you here is really the Van der Waals explorer volume interaction between that monomer and another monomer there, between that monomer and that monomer there. But on top of that, I have all the other things going on. This is a daunting task, right? This is a very, very difficult task. Um, nevertheless, we are going to do it. We, we are going to do uh, in a baby-like way, because I don't want to be over impressed by the richness of the problem. And I want to you know, go through the big forest and go to the heart of the issue as much as possible, and then shroud myself with all the necessary details. So that's what I want to do. Okay, how do you do, go about doing this? Before doing that, I also want to emphasize one more aspect of uh, this problem, because it's going to come in handy uh, in terms of making this a baby step forward so that there's an economy in terms of thinking, economy in terms of doing work and also thinking process, which is related to, again, a question that was asked by Arun yesterday, uh, which is this. If I go to a problem like this, but in a solution, and there is a very beautiful theory by Bragg and Williams a long, long ago in metallurgy, but that was kind of copied by Flory and Huggins, which I'll write the names shortly. Basically, we, they imagine a lattice and they'll put a polymer chain in here. This is a polymer chain. In a lattice, three dimensional lattice, suppose like this, like that. And then they said, okay, the interaction energy between two segments, polymer and polymer segments, let me call this to be epsilon PP. 
and everything else is solvent. And let's say the interaction energy between a polymer segment and a solvent is, say, epsilon Ps. And the interaction energy between a solvent and a solvent, let's say, is epsilon Ss. What they did was the total for this system on average sense, random mixing, average sense, they calculated the free energy of this mixed state. And then what they found was this. I'll return to this in, again after about 20 minutes, but I want to introduce it right away. Delta Fm by Kt, that's a mixing free energy. This has two parts. One is entropy of mixing, like ideal gas law, for example. And the other one is energy of mixing, or energy or free energy, energy of mixing. This turns out to be a number of polymer chains, log volume fraction, fraction of sites occupied by the polymer phi one, and then number of solvent molecules, say let's say N2, log phi two, fraction of volume fraction of solvent molecules, phi one plus phi two is equal to one. Now for the energy of mixing, total number of sites in the lattice, which is the number volume of the system, here comes the parameter chi times of phi one, phi two. This chi is related to, let me write down this chi. This chi is equal to, Z is a coordination number in the lattice divided by KBT. Then I have this epsilon PS minus half epsilon SS plus epsilon PP. Although there are three interaction parameters, there's a bragg william theory of metal alloys or polymer mixtures. They conspire into only one parameter. Although there are three interactions come into one parameter. That's the reason why we could write this interaction energy by considering all impossible interactions. In fact, it turns out this V I'm writing here is equal to one minus two chi. So that's a connection between classical literature. This was done in 1940s. Okay, this was done by great heroes like Sam Edwards in UK and Pierre Gilles Dujan in France, right? This is modern and prior to that it was prompted, but these are the heroes who did this. So this, these are two different worlds, modern world and, and classical world. That, that connection is given by this one. Right. Now let's look at this one. Suppose I have polymer solvent interaction with a U between polymer and solvent and a distance R. Say, let's say it will look like this plus minus. And let's say U between solvent and solvent R. Let's say it looks like that. And similarly, for the U, PP, and with respect to R, let's say it looks like that. So this is negative, this is negative. So here, the negative, this number is I'm talking about this epsilon PS, for example. Yeah, so yeah, epsilon PS is this one. So you can see, look at this, given this, if this is more attractive, polymer is going to mix well with solvent. So you can put in numbers in here, if this is much more negative, when chi is a negative, then this is going to dominate. Therefore, they are going to mix. When chi is a negative, V is positive. Okay, so that's the connection between the phase diagram, Flory Huggins theory, as well as this pseudo potential we are talking about. Okay, and that also means we are in a good solution, and vice versa. Now, therefore, if I having understood this one, I can go back and look at this one. If this is a parameter, how do I work backwards to write in my Hamiltonian? Excuse me, sir, uh, there is a question. Is there any relation between epsilon PS and epsilon PP and PPSS? Any relation between? These three quantities, epsilon, are they completely independent? Of they are independent. Hmm? Yeah. 
they are independent. But in uh, the global behavior, right. they combine in this particular fashion, within mean field theory, in this particular fashion, to give me only one parameter. Okay, so, all right, so now I want to work backwards, right? So I have a parameter, then in formulating calculations to interpret external data, we will need to write a Hamiltonian, right? So therefore I need to get some sort of a potential in a Hamiltonian, how do I get that? In order to get that, I'm going to say, U, because Hamiltonian is going to be like this, U R I J, between i and j, I'm going to write this to be v l cubed delta of r i j. Why do we do that? Because I know this parameter. Why do we do that? Because let's do a high temperature expansion. U i j over t, t is high, large. Therefore, one minus, you know, they go away. And then if I substitute that value here, doing this integral over r will give me simply v, v l cubed. So, I determine this is the parameter which is different from all the chemistry. This goes into my Hamiltonian as potential. Okay. This is a technical point, but nevertheless an important point. Okay, so given this, now what I need to do is I need to go back and put charges. I already told you about uh, this problem. Suppose I have a charge here, say plus charge here from say some charge here, Z I. E is the electronic charge. This is ZJ electronic charge. Again, the distance between them is let's say, let's say R. Then the electrostatic interaction energy as a function of R in parity free energy is what is this? ZI, ZJ. This is my question to you folks that I'll write it for you anyway. BRM length, one over R. But on top of that, if I have salt ions, electrolyte ions in the medium, which has to be electrically neutral in the medium, then what I have is e to the minus kappa r. This kappa, I mentioned in the debye huckel theory, that turns out to be 4 pi BRM length, summation over gamma, z gamma square, number of gamma type times V. V is volume, number of cations, N gamma, gamma is either plus or minus, plus corresponds to cations, um, negative subscript corresponds to anions, salt ions. So this is basically salt concentration, this is the valency of uh, the ions. Chloride, it is one. Potassium, it is one, right? Okay. And then I also said, the kappa inverse is a divide length, which I said is going to go like CS square root. The reason is this is concentration of potassium ions, concentration of chloride ions, and I do the sum two times salt concentration. And this is four pi LB, you know what that is. And that is kappa square. Therefore, divide length goes like one over square plus CS. Okay, this is what I said, and that's what happens here. Now, when we have poly electrolytes, charged macromolecules, we need to modify this. So how do you do this? We do this in the following way. So here is my polymer chain. Let's imagine here is my segment of contour length L, length L. There is another segment here. I'm interested in figuring out the interaction between this and this. Each segment may have five monomers or 10 monomers. Right, because I'm coarse graining already. So there must be the valence is not one. So let me call that to be the charge of that is to be a ZP. ZP is number of monomers, chargeable ionized monomers per Kuhn segment. And then E, this is ZPE. And I want to know the interaction between them. And that would be, let, let's write uh, electro, electrostatic interaction as a function of R, R between these two segments would be. That's easy, right? ZP square, one ZP times ZP, that E square goes into my theorem length. And then R, E to the minus again R. This will happen if I integrate out all the ions. 
then exactly the same formula that I had there before, which would be kappa square would be equal to four pi LB summation over gamma, Z gamma square N gamma by V. Right. But this is not correct. Why is that? I pick on your shoulder. Why is that? And the reason is poly electrolytes do not live alone. Charge and macromolecules cannot live alone because that will be explosive. They always have counter ions. They always have counter ions. Therefore, for all the charge uh, groups, there are counter ions. And I have to use a different color to show those counter ions. Let's assume this is polyanion, then I'll have small counter ions there. They are not negligible in general. When you have more and more polymers, there'll be more and more counter ions. Therefore, I will have to worry about ZC square and number of counter ions divided by volume, right? And then plus here, there. That would be my definition of kappa because counter ions are moving around. They are having translation entropy. That means in real world, real world of real experimental laboratory, kappa is never equal to zero. Never, unless you want to do theory. Theory, you can do anything. Computer simulation can do anything, right? Even giants have looked at kappa equal to zero, exactly zero. And then you do renomination group theory, et cetera, but it's not real, real world. On the other hand, in my argument, I will take kappa going to zero limit. And I'll call this to be salt free. And I say salt free, I'm not taking kappa equal to zero. It's, you know, asymptotically, I may argue, but that's the limit I'm looking at. That means that this is not that important, right? This is not that important. I mean, there is no salt, but still it is important. That is related to the concentration of the polymer. All right, now there's one more catch, which is related to what Arun was asking. And that catch is this. If you take a yeah, polymer chain, right? Suppose I take a polymer chain and put in a liquid, polar, polar liquid, and uh, let's calculate the dielectric constant of this composite medium. Let's calculate that. What you do is go to your classical electro dynamics book, Jackson, Griffiths, whatever book your favorite book is. And then you derive the cautious Minsotti law, right? Because the refractive indices are different, dot, 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 you do this. If you do that calculation, get the number, that number does not agree with the experiments. The number is orders of magnitude different from experimental number, experimental value. You see, experimentally, you can get from dilated spectroscopy, you can do optics, you know, on and on. Doesn't happen. So then on the other hand, a long time ago, I, I think 1910 or something, 1910, 12, I don't know how it was possible for humans. Peter Dubai made an experiment and we know him as a great theorist, but he made the experiment. What he did was he took two N groups chemically modified and watched how these two N groups would recombine. And that recombination will be dictated by the dielectric constant. When he did these measurements and subsequently verified by several other people, what they found was for near a backbone, if I look at the dielectric constant, experimentally measured dielectric constant as a function of distance from the backbone of the chain, it was somewhere from something like five, five to some number like this, it went like that. This is about 10 nanometers. When you go about 10 nanometers away, this, this turns out to be eight. That's an experimental fact. So near the backbone of the chain, 
very close to that, dielectric constant is low. And then as I told you before, the VRM length is the inversely related to the dielectric constant, therefore the binding is very strong. Therefore, under any conditions, experimental conditions, the degree of ionization is not complete. It is not ZP. For a given experimental condition, there will always be counter-ions adsorbing. That is unique to that particular situation. The value of the degree of ionization, is, you, you see this also in titration curves. It is always unique to a particular condition. If you change temperature or if you sprinkle a little salt, also will differ. So therefore, what I should do is, I should not say ZPE, I should say alpha ZPE. Alpha ZPE, alpha is the degree of ionization because of condensation of counter ions near the pi of the chain. And this is the reason why I said uh, in my yesterday, there is a warm around the back of the chain where local dielectric constant is lower. But if we do the averaging over, you could do the clashes Musochi, then the number would not be right. And in fact, man, I mean, maybe tomorrow I can say a little bit about this issue, if I have time, on uh, how uh, this is such an important effect. Okay, so therefore, what I will do is, I will go back to this. In addition to this term, I'm gonna do electrostatic. Can you move this please, next one? Okay, this I already said, please, next one. Yeah, please stop here. Okay, so I already said this one, right? So counter unbinding, therefore we have alpha ZPE, alpha ZPE, next one, please. Okay, so now, oh, yeah, good, thank you. So what I have is, I have the electrostatic part. Did I lose it already? I'm perfectly capable of losing things. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, here it is. I found it. Thank you. I got it. Okay, so I'm just repeating. Now this is a summary here. Kappa is never zero in experiments, but I'm going to take that limit. Whenever I say this, that's what I mean. And then here is infra ZPE. There should be alpha ZPE, as I'm pointing out earlier. So therefore, now here, uh, kappa square would be, again, um, number of counter ions there, zt square. I must account for that one. And this, is, these are, this term is coming from salt. This term is coming from counter ion. Next one, please. OK. So this is a summary of what we should do. I take my polymer here in a solvent. The electrostatic part is given by that term. I'm repeating again. This is kappa square, I think. That should be kappa square. There's a typo there. Okay, here is a V. That's the extreme volume part. That is this part. So I have to add this and that. I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to be like a baby, a little bit. Babies don't cheat, but you know, this is going to be very simple. Because this is a big point that I want to share with you because that makes life easy for us to make measurements, very simple measurements and probe into the behavior of charge micromolecules. What is that? This guy, LB over R, LB is a barium line, comes out, alpha ZP is LP. One over R, E to the minus kappa R. This is Yukawa potential, right? We know that. But it has a very simple physical limit. When kappa is zero, which is, I'm calling salt free, zero is one over R, that's Coulombic, no problem. But remarkably, or very simply, if kappa is large enough, that is, I put enough amount of salt, Kappa is related to square root of salt concentration, enough amount of salt, then what happens is this simply turns out to be a delta function. This, right? So that is like this term that we are doing. I already told you here, somewhere here, I put, um, maybe it's over there. I put U to be a delta function, right? I parameterized, I parameterized, oh, it's not here. I parameterized, okay, it's, yeah, here it is. I parameter the x-volume interaction to be V L, L cubed times delta function. So I'm bringing the, the role of electrostatics if I have sufficient amount of salt into the same form as the 
form that we had for uncharged systems. Perhaps it's a mathematical trick, but it's a very profound implication, right? That prefactor now is simply given by four pi over kappa square. And kappa square tells me how much salt I added and how many counter ions I have. And it's the delta function. So what I have to do is I have to simply add them together. And we did all the hard work even in the last lecture in terms of chain expansion. So we simply take this in and do the calculation. Next one, please. Okay, let's do that. Instead of going through lots of details here, because we did this yesterday, right? So the free energy over KT is coming from this form entropy, three by the R squared by NL squared. And this is my VL cubed N squared by R cubed. Remember, this is pairwise interaction energy I told you here. And the density square times the volume, that will give me this. And between these two terms, I showed you R by L is going like V power one fifth times N to the three fifth. And it gave experimental validation, right? Experimental data, I showed you that it works. It should work here too, because of the rigorous argument I'm making here. Now, due to electrostatics, I have four pi LB over kappa square, alpha ZP, right? Square and the N square by R cube. Therefore, this V can be rewritten as V effective, namely dressed up by electrostatics to be plus four pi alpha square ZP square bearing like by kappa square L cubed. Do the same calculation that I did over there yesterday. Then the radius gyration will go like V plus this quantity for one fifth times n to the three fifth. Experimentally validate. That's what you observe. Life can be simple. Such a complicated problem. How do you do this, right? But we simply think in a very simple, straightforward fashion. Next one, please. Okay. Now let's do the salt free case. We'll do the same argument in the salt free case. Um, ideal polyelectric chain, we call it, all right? Because, because it doesn't, doesn't happen in the real world. Kappa is equal to zero, right? Not possible. And kappa is equal to zero, the pair with the total pair with interaction energy would be LB, alpha square, ZP square, LB, uh, one over two, double counting, one over RIJ. We did this typically in the largest, in terms of scaling arguments, I could write this to be one over R, N square, one sum giving me n, another sum giving me n, n squared by r. Therefore, my free energy in this premise is r squared by nl squared entropy, which we did so many times, v n squared by r cubed, the extra volume interaction. And then here I have lb alpha squared zp squared n squared by r. And since it's going to expand, right, the, due to electrostatics, uh, this term is going to be weaker than the other term. We can work out with paper and pencil. When you balance this term and that term, here is R squared, one over R here, therefore R cubed scales like this thing, and then N comes here, N cubed. So for R goes like alpha squared, ZP squared, LB for one third times N. So radius duration is linear with chain length, which is intuitively obvious. Rod-like, you, you will think. But do you remember this uh, theoretical situation, right? Experimentally, it's impossible to observe this. So far, you can't do this experiment. People do AFM, people do fluorescent spectroscopy, no, you can't do it because there are always counter ions. You can't escape from counter ions, right? In addition, there is also a problem. Before I go to that problem, could you please go back again and go this? I say high salt limit is like this, experimentally validated. Go to the other one, please, forward. I say this is not possible to do a low salt. There should be a question here before I ask that question myself. Somebody in the back row? I say in the high salt limit, I have this, in the low salt limit, what is this? How many of you are experimentalists in the last row? Okay, so it's an experimental question. Yeah. What do you mean by high salt? Is it a 10 molar? 0.1 molar, that's important, right? What do you mean by high salt or low salt, right? Practically speaking, the experiments to show that if you have a concentrated salt concentration of 0.01 molar, right? 
Uh, that falls into the category of high salt. You don't have to go to one molar or two molar. Practically speaking, for these systems, 0.01 molar is already pushes us into this, this situation. This is really fantastic, right? You know, when I'm the way I was introducing my lecture yesterday, right? We are our life is very delicate, right? It's a very delicate balance of lots of things. If you want to go down to very low salt content, if you drink a lot of water, you know, you know cases where people die by drinking a lot of water, right? Because you're dilating, right? You know, you, you don't want to do that. So there is a delicate balance of how much salt you need to have, really. So 0.01 molar is good enough for the experimental uh, situations. Okay, next slide, please. Why is not seen in the experiment? Here is a bizarre thing, right? Mother nature is beautiful, right? I mean, we don't have to say that, right? Imagine low salt concentration means repulsion is going to be homopolymer poly. Suppose I have DNA, another DNA molecule, and they are going to be away from each other as much as possible. One DNA is uniformly charged, negative charge, another DNA, right? Single standard, double standard, doesn't matter. They are going to be far away from each other. That would be the most stable case. Experiments will show when you do scattering, neutron scattering, light scattering, X-ray scattering, show at the low angles, that is, when you are looking at large scale structures, you see a peak. You see a huge peak, enhances scattering, scattering intensity at low angles. That is really amazing. It is counterintuitive. This implies that a similarly charged polymers are able to aggregate. And I take the same system and add some salt. That peak goes away. It's exactly the opposite of what you would expect. Because if you sprinkle salt, the electrostatic is screened, and then hydrophobicity dominates. When the hydrophobicity dominates, you think you will, they will aggregate. No, the other way around. On top of that, the salt free case. On top of that, there is also a peak at a finite wave vector Q, wave vector K. Right? This is called a polyelectric peak. And that peak position, right, K max, is proportional to square root of polymer concentration. Polyl DNA concentration in this in this case sodium polysin sulfate doesn't matter what it is it's always square root of C. So what is going on? So then that's a complication. That's a big surprise. We'll return to this shortly. Okay, now let me go back to the Florida again theory. I'll remind you again, and because we are going to mint some, we are going to win some lottery by by what I just said. Right, what I had already said on the floor. Okay, this is the way the theory was composed by Flory and Huggins. But the basic assumptions are they are randomly mixed. And if you want to be a connoisseur in theory, we want to look at the fluctuations, correlations, et cetera, which we are perfectly capable of doing, right? Entropy mixing, energy of mixing. This is my Flory Huggins chi parameter, which is basically is a chemical mismatch parameter, right? As was asked earlier. This depends on the chemical details between, you know, I mean, there could be subtle differences or big differences. That's what it plays a role. And I already told you the extra volume parameter V to be one minus two chi. That's in here, V is equal to one minus two chi. Next slide, please. Yeah. Say it, say it again. Phi one is a volume fraction of component one. Phi two is a volume fraction of component number two. Right here, the phi one, here is in the case, say it's a polymer, phi two is volume fraction, volume fraction of a solvent, or vice versa, whatever way you want to do it. And this is a bread and butter in polymer age. This is how they make polymer alloys. The materials that we have for some of these materials, in this name you would, other materials are used based upon the use of that formula, which may be a common topic. Okay, so now I go to uh, solutions of charged polymers. Because if I'm talking about poly, polymer solution with salt more than 0.01 molar, I can use this formula because I have already written down V effectively V plus that, right? That means since V is equal to one minus two chi, which I wrote down before, oh, here. Therefore, V effective can be written as one minus two chi effective because V I write it to be one minus two chi. And if I do this, Chi effective turns out to be whatever chi we had from the chemistry without charges minus 
this quantity, alpha square, ZP square, LB, or kappa square. And we know kappa square. Kappa square is related to salt concentration, right? And here, the chi is 1 over T, right? Chi is this chemical mismatch and 1 over T, 1 over temperature. So what I have is I have an amazing handle by Mother Nature to play with the temperature. I told you my physiological temperature is fixed, extremely narrow range of one degree Kelvin fluctuation. That's all. I can't afford to more, do more than that. But with salt, I can have the same effect as a change in temperature. I can elicit the same effect by physical salt, right? Because this is what appears in the charge systems. So now I have one over T, some number here, of course. And then here I have some number here, depending on how I decorate my backbone of the chain with charges and ionize, you know, dot, dot, dot. Then I have one over CS. What does this mean? If you see as if it's supposed to decrease the ionic strength or concentration, it is equivalent to right, in, right, decrease in salt concentration, increasing temperature. Right? If I go down, when I increase, when it decreases, it becomes a larger and there's a negative sign that is equivalent to increasing the temperature. Or other way around, when I add salt, it's decreasing temperature. So whatever phase transitions I want to see with the lowering the temperature, I could elicit them by sprinkling salt. So uh, in some cases, suppose you have some dis undissociated moieties uh, and in, you increase the temperature, you can actually increase the dissociation. So in this case, your salt concentration is not changing at all, right? No, this is an excellent question. So, so this, I was careful to make qualifying statement, um, right? Because I knew that this, this is going to be very important. When I said alpha ZPE, that alpha is unique to a particular experimental condition. When you change the environment, when you change, suppose I take water and put a little bit of isopropanol, for example, conditions are different. You change a pH, the conditions are different. The alpha is not a given number, simple number. It depends upon every experiment that you are doing. And also, it depends on whether you are looking at a dynamical experiment or an equilibrium experiment. So thank you for raising this. This is an extremely important point. This is, uh, this is very important in experiments. Absolutely right, right. Absolutely, this is extremely important. So you cannot take a formula from a book and then uh, simply implement it from, uh, to interpret your data because alpha is not a single number. The net charge of a poly polymer, the net charge of an RNA molecule is not a single number. If you change the temperature, it's different. If you put salt, it's different. If you change pH, it's different. It's a completely different behavior. This is the magic, right? But nevertheless, the important point is that when I change the conditions, right, the, I can get the physics of a different temperature, right? We know we are trained in physics community. We are trained to think of the temperature, high temperature, no phase transition, low temperature, a lot of phase transition. So all, of, all of them can be elicited in terms of uh, salt concentration. So salt is my handle. This is Mother Nature's handle. And similarly, in the human body, you can create salt concentration gradients, a sodium pump, potassium pump, right? When you create concentration gradients, ionic strength gradients, magic happens, life happens because the charges are tuned depending upon what, what, what happened and the interactions, the range of interactions, how molecules communicate, et cetera. This is a beautiful universe, <laughs> right? There are some particular kind of range. Uh, beyond that, we can play. Salt might have some certain. Is there is analogous to that, or you can still play? Uh, well, a salt concentration, as I was telling you, right? Uh, if you vary salt concentration, the behavior of these macromolecules will be different, right? And that dictates whether life happens, proceeds, or not. For example, you can collapse certain polymers, poly charged polymers by having high salt concentration. Mother nature doesn't like it. So there are boundaries, practical boundaries that the system itself is regulating to control the amount of salt in your body. Yes, there is a range. Theoretically, in our experiments, we put up to five molar salt to see what the physics is about. 
but that's not real physiological condition, right? So there is in principle, right? But the, in terms of temperature, right? Yes, theoretically, you can have any temperature you want. If you take polymers, if you heat, heat it up, they are going to decompose, they'll vaporize. So there is a practical temperature range. And uh, for all these charged polymers, I'm not interested in making glasses. I don't want to go below uh, zero degree Celsius. Why? Because then it's ice. The molecules, you know, it's not going to, unless they want to preserve fish. Right? That's a different thing, right? So, so there is also practical range in temperature. Similarly, for salt concentration, there is a practical range. And there is also a very big influence in terms of what salt that is. Is it a lithium chloride or potassium chloride? Huge difference. By changing the temperature itself and same thing that we are getting by changing the salt itself. Yeah. Then what is the extra uh, benefits that? Uh... It's not the question of what I want to get, what I want to understand. <laughs> Right. I want to understand how these micromolecules behave in a naturally environment. That's what I want to understand. Yeah, if you want to get data, yeah, I can do a lot of different things. Okay, it depends on what our goals are. We can talk more. No, the, no, the affected temperature coming from the salt. The salt, I could reinterpret, right? I could reinterpret this term to be. If, right, yeah, if the soil concentration, you can work out the algebra, right? If the soil concentration is low, right, the affected temperature would be higher. If this is low, there's negative sign, low is the denominator, soil concentration low. No, 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 the, the numbers would make sure the temperature cannot be negative, right? Yeah, yeah, so you have to work out all these numbers that I put it in. The, 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 the concept, right? It's quality. Then you had to go to your notebook, lab notebook, and punch in the numbers, put in numbers, and calculate it. But the important thing is when you lower the salt concentration, you behave, the system behaves like higher temperature phase because that makes sense. Lower the salt concentration means the repulsion is manifest. Suppose it's repelling polymer, repulsion manifest, and they are going to be spread out. And that means a high temperature phase. Right? When I dump a lot of salt, the, uh, the electrons interact with the screen, then they'll come close and then, and then precipitate it down. And that's the concept that I'm telling you. So instead of changing the temperature, change and heat it up so it's more like gas-like, cool it more like a liquid-like, instead of this, I could do the same thing by playing with some other salt. That's the argument that I'm making. You, everything will be different. Dynamically, you are going to have a treat tomorrow, right? Be ready with all the puzzles. The dynamics is amazing. I'll give you a tease. Double standard DNA, single standard DNA, give me a number. Um, 20 kilo base pairs, right? The diffusion coefficient of that large macromolecule can be comparable to that of a small ion. We'll talk about it tomorrow. That's a homework problem. Think about it. Oh, this is a beautiful question. All right, this is really fantastic. Thank you for raising this. Okay, dielectric constant. Okay, this is again, you know, this is amazing world, right? The dielectric constant uh, here, LB is one over dielectric constant, right? Wherever, wherever that is, LB, I'll write it again because it's worth writing. Beer on length is equal to electronic charge square, there by four pi, permittivity of atom, no play there. That's given, right? That's given. Here, epsilon, and then is KBT. This epsilon is coming from the polarized medium, epsilon of water. Right? We always say 80 or something like this at room temperature. This is a temperature dependent. This is temperature dependent. Why? When you change the temperature, the organization of water molecules is changing. Polarizability is changing. Dilute tensile is changing. And in fact, this is one of the gifts of Mother Nature. And maybe that's why water is a good thing for living. Epsilon as a function of temperature 
as a function of temperature under interesting conditions of water, not ice or steam, decreases the temperature. That has a very profound effect because therefore the epsilon is actually is not, it, it's a free energy, it's a contributor to the free energy because of organization. This is, uh, you know, we milked, uh, in our in my, my laboratory, we, this one actually we used extensively uh, to make uh, contributions to understand what's going on. Okay. It's not a constant. Let's go back to this. Okay. Uh, next one. Right. So what does that mean? That means if I take, for example, a typical phase diagram for polymers, this is a temperature right, going up, and this is a phase separation, right, the amount of polymers, phi2 is volume fraction of the polymer in this particular case, and the other one solvent, and these are for different molecular weights, this is a synthetic system, and since the chi is one over temperature, same thing can be written like this, chi versus volume fraction, this is chi critical, and this is the temperature critical, you know, it's upside down because chi is reciprocal, and you know all about this phase behavior, I'm not going to go into details in the interest of time, if a chi is greater than chi critical, we'll have critical phenomena. So going back to my comments that I made, if our salt is playing a role, this modulating the temperature, it's playing the role of temperature, I can move this phase diagram, the charges up and down. I can have membraneless organelles. I can have phase separation, liquid liquid phase separation inside a mammalian cell. Or I could make food materials because they are charged by putting salt. Right? I can play the whole game with the salt in terms of pushing up and down, whether the food that I'm making is going to settle down at the bottom of my, my chatti, whatever, you know, bucket, whatever that is, um, dish. What is, what do you, how do you call this one? Well, thank you. Oh, well, that's good enough. Or oh, it's going to be floating around uniformly. All those things are different with the salt. So with their salt, I don't want to like, I don't want to make, you know, I don't want to eat food with their salt, right? So I don't want to have homogeneous, I want to have homogeneous things. I don't want to be, you know, uh, settling down. All those things we can play around with salt. This will take another full lecture of how we do these things. In the interest of time, I'm not going to do this. Next slide, please. Yeah, please. Uh, this is uh, people call to be, see, the way they determine this is using cloud point measurements, right? Is the next, this is a very old paper. This is a 1940 paper. They phase separation temperature or something like this. Basically, it's a temperature. Forget about subscript P. T is temperature, 20 degrees Celsius for 30 degrees Celsius. No, no, this is experimental data. Excellent. This T is temperature. This is a coexistence curve for different molecular weights. I believe this polystyrene cyclohexane or something like that. I'm just giving an example of phase operation at a temperature below a critical temperature, which is equivalent to chi being greater than chi critical. Right. Same thing happens. Same thing happens so far. Not here. Oh, okay. For charged polymers. As I said, I'm not going to go into details of the phase diagrams of charged polymers because that will take me far away from the conceptual framework. Right? So what I want to show you is, I go here, similar to this graph, I have a phase diagram like this. I want to go to the homogeneous phase. That is a uniform one phase. There's no phase separation. All molecules are supposed to be hanging around happily. And that's the place that I want to go, go in. Already, there is going to be a big problem there. Next slide, please. I go to homogeneous space. In the homogeneous space, you can intuitively think in terms of very dilute situation. Yeah, there's always a liquid, but I call it to be gas-like. And um, I must say, right, one of our great heroes in a polymer physics, Pierre Dujan, and he was very poetic in coming up with very nice names, and he called this to be gas-like, right? <laughs> At very dilute conditions. And then we increase the concentration. This is a homogeneous space. In case of concentration, it's liquid-like, and then they interpenetrate, semi-dilute, 
and then there's a constant region, and then is the dry polyalkylate salt, charged salt. Okay, I will not do justice to describe this. That will take again another lecture. Right? But uh, nevertheless, I like to uh, make commentary on these uh, two aspects. There's a homogeneous phase, single phase, but still there is structure. There is structure. The structure is reflected by the presence of this a peak, polyelectric peak at finite uh, wave vector k. And as I already mentioned, the maximum value of k, corresponding that peak, is proportional square root of polymer concentration in the salt free case. In the salty case, it's easy because that's more like our previous system. The, we don't have these structures where because it's all, the charges are screened up. And I talk about point oh, 0.01 molar and above, life becomes easy. This interesting thing happens only at a low salt concentrations. Okay. And then I also want to address something about enhanced scattering intensity at low Q. Why is that? Because they are not supposed to happen. They are supposed to be far away from each other in the salt free case. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. How do we do this? And this is going to be a very technical uh, aspect. So I just want to show uh, to, in terms of uh, you know, accountability that yes, our community is very well trained in field theory techniques, um, extremely talented. This is a theory institution. They know how to do Feynman diagrams and all these things in here. I just want to simply point out that we need to do double screening self-consistently. One is the electrostatic screening, other one is the topological screening. They are not separated out because I'm talking about two screenings in here, but they have to coexist. So you have to do this. So we do that. We know how to do that. At the end of the day, if you do that, what do you get is a scattering intensity K shows a peak. It goes like K square for small K radically, for large K, it decays like one over K square. And there is a correlation length for this concentration fluctuations mediated by there's a concept of topological screening and electrostatic screening. And in fact, that screening length goes like one over square root of C. C is polymer concentration, charged polymer concentration. Therefore, K max will go to square root. So that's the answer to this, but it's really a theoretical resolution of the experimental fact. And quantitatively, we can make comparisons and work beautifully well. Next slide, please. This one, low handle peak is, uh, has been a surprise. And the reason you must guess already, the reason is what uh, the question was raised before. The question is this, there is a binding. When you have a binding of counter ions on the backbone of the chain because of the local dielectric constant mismatch, always there is counter ion absorption on the backbone. That's the reason we have the degree of ionization alpha. And I already told you it's a dipole. The ion pair makes a dipole. So when I have one polymer chain having a dipole along this chain, another polymer chain having a dipole, right? Dipole along the polymer chain, right? Although they like to be far away from each other, because of the dipole interaction, they can also pair. This dipole also can pair with this dipole. Then that can create many quadrupoles. And if you put in the numbers, these quadrupoles are pretty strong. Normally we think dipoles are weak, but when you put the numbers, you know, given the data content, they are pretty strong. If that happens, it makes a transient network. They are similarly charged polymers, but yet they could make a population of aggregates. And you calculate it. When you calculate that, you get, right? So this is the idea here. The quadrupoles, there is a quadrupole energy, that's about 10 kT per quadrupole, and the time involved in making all of these quadrupoles to disappear is going to be infinitely long. Therefore, it acts like a physical gel. And if you look at the distribution of the size of them, you get something like more like a mycelization problem. And therefore, you get finite size clusters, that intensity goes up, which you will see only in small angles. So that's the resolution of that. Okay, given that, in the interest of time again, let me share with you uh, a small story. Suppose these are not transient networks like this. Suppose they deliberately make a hydrogel. That is, take my polyelectrolytes, charge macromolecules, and I cross-link them. 
I can cross-link them in many ways. I can put calcium, I could put magnesium because it's divalent. They can bring two oppositely charged units together and make a bond, make a cross-link. And I can wash it out by diluting with monovalent salts and things like that. So many, I can play a lot of things. So let's try to understand the simple physics behind hydrogel, how it's going to behave. Let's be baby-like. Let's do that. Next slide, please. Here. So this is my model. I have, let's say, negatively charged uh, strands. That's one crosslink, another crosslink. I can do it chemically or physically, right? And then there are salt ions in here. Of course, there is water. So network of N strands, little N strands, terminated by two junctions. Uh, N segments per strand, the way I was talking there. And polymer volume fraction is, uh, I think it's pi. And there is a number of crosslinks. And how do I think about the stability of this gel and the behavior of the gel? How do I do this? How do, how do, how do, what do I have to do? Next slide, please. In an experimental laboratory, what they do is this. They take a dry network. I don't know how many people played with Jello, making Jello. Did you? You did. Anybody else? You get a powder, put in a, in a glass beaker and pour water, and then after about how long? 20 minutes? Something 20 minutes, big jelly comes out, and then of course you can eat. You must have made pudding, right? Same story, right? Lime. lime also. Next time, I don't like lime. Did you? Okay. I like jello. Okay, never mind. So, network. So, some volume, right? What people do is put water, and then you get a solid gel. Get a nice one. You can do this pat and then elastically active, very beautiful, nice feeling, soft, soft. And then I can also induce a phase transitions in that. I know how to do it. How would I do this? Salt. That's what I would do. You remember tofus? Tofu without salt, idli without salt, forget it, right? But with salt, it has very beautiful behaviors, right? So salt, you can do phase transition, real phase transition you can do in a dual statistical mechanics. And you can also deform. You can stretch it, right? You can pat it on the you know, back and things like that. A lot of wonderful things you can do, right? But how do I theorize it? This is the experimental world. I go from here, that is easy to do. I can do this, I can do that. But theory is not easy to do. Why? Every theory I'm talking about, the starting point is this one. This is my starting point. In the starting point, I say, it's a Gaussian chain. So my reference frame is a Gaussian chain. Right? And then I dress it up with the charges, sequences, hydrophobicity, et cetera. So what we do then is I go from here to here by two steps. I first, I take magically, I convert this into a reference state. And then to this reference state where the chain strands are all undergoing Gaussian statistics. And then I go uh, add the solvent and swell it. And I do all the flow rehug and and everything that we are going to do. Therefore, there's going to be a parameter going from this to the reference state because I do not know the statistics of the change in here. Very nice work in France uh, based, on, based on neutron scattering about what's happening uh, between the, in the strands in the network, but it's not conclusive yet because it's very difficult. It's highly heterogeneous, right? So if you take rubber, for example, right? If you want to swell it, it's, it's a very difficult problem. But nevertheless, there's going to be a parameter in making this a reference state, which you will see. If you see phi zero, that's a parameter which represents the volume fraction of this dry network, but in the Gaussian state, if you see in the next slides. Okay, that's the way people do, or at least I do. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are the important ingredients? Uh, there are three important, important ingredients. Well, number one is mixing, because I have solvent and the polymers. I already gave you the equations, the floric against theory. That's what we are going to use. And then there's going to be an elasticity term because when I take this, it's going to swell. The solvent goes in, it likes to make this trans go in. Junctions, keeping them uh, in shape. And then this is a very important thing. Ions, they have to get distributed. I take this and put in an electrolyte solution, water, electrolyte solution. Ions are going to get partitioned between 
the background, and inside the jaw. Then, based upon these three contributions, we calculate the osmotic pressure, which is taking the derivative of this with respect to the volume of that gel. And then you make this condition that osmotic pressure should be zero at equilibrium. Then you know everything about the gel. That's a, that's a recipe. This you can do with paper and pencil, which I'm going to show you how to do it, but I'm not going to do it on the board. Right. Then I also want to make sure it's a stable. How do we do that? I measure, I calculate based upon this, this, I know pi, osmotic pressure. So I know the osmotic modulus and it better be positive. If it's negative, that's a stability limit, then I have a phase transition, right? Which I don't want to have under normal circumstances. So that's the recipe of doing theory, right? Next slide, please. Okay, let's go one after the other. Free energy of mixing, I told you, right? Phi log, phi one, uh, plus phi two log phi two plus chi n zero phi one phi two. Here one is my polymer, two is my solvent. The n one is, I made a mistake. N one is solvent. This is my polymer. N one is solvent, and that's the volume fraction. But here, this is right. These two terms are translational entropy. I think I wrote it down here somewhere here. Translational entropy. This is the number of molecules undergoing translational entropy. Uh, this is number of molecules undergoing translation entropy. But here, since I have one component being a gel network, there's only one molecule. On the other hand, number of molecules in here is Avogadro number. Therefore, this is only one compared to 10 to the 23. Therefore, this term is not important. I'm not going to talk about it. So that's one. That's not important. Therefore, free energy mixing goes like the second term, one minus phi log, one minus phi is volume fraction of this polymer making the network. And then that's a chi times phi times one minus phi. But please remember now, we have a fantastic tool to account for electrostatics. That chi effective now is a regular chi with the salt concentration I derived in the previous slides. That's all I have to do. Take this and put it there. That's where electrostatics go, goes in. And then I got it made. So therefore, from this, I can get the osmotic pressure coming from the mixing entropy. Next slide, please. Okay, elasticity. I take my gel and, and I stretch it in all three different directions. It deform it in one direction from original dimension to see if the lambda is uh, stretching extent. It could be stretching or compression. Similarly, other three directions. Now, these are all, this whole network is made up of the chains. So I have a chain to begin with like this. And then when I stretch it, for example, it's going to change its end-to-end -end distance. And let's assume it's affine deformation. That is, every molecule is stretching the way the macroscopic deformation is conducted. And I know how to deal with this because I showed you a formula before. The end to end distance, the free energy to keep end to end distance r goes like r square over nl square. I also showed you the other term, which is also responsible for compression, right? So when you do this, that is for a Gaussian chain, that's what that is. And that is going to go in here. Putting that in here with a simple paper and pencil calculation, you can calculate the osmotic pressure coming from elasticity. It's very simple, actually. I can work it on the board if I have time, right? But it's very easy. And obviously, and intuitively uh, resonant, uh, this elasticity gives a negative pressure, right? Because when I'm stretching it, right, there's a negative pressure, right? Works against the swelling. The negative pressure is working against that. So that's Number two. Now let's talk about salt. Three. Please, next one. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Then you, you, I also showed a formula, the Langevin function is more finitely extensible uh, chain statistics. Right. And that's what I would use. But very heavily counseling system, you can do that. But there's no challenge in terms of concept or even practice. Yeah. yeah. This is true for long enough spans between weekly, gently counseling to ones. And uh, in fact, in, in uh, physiological conditions, gently counseling to one is much more uh, present. All right. And you can imagine why? Because we want them to be highly elastic. If it's highly cross-linked, it would not be that elastic. Now, I don't want to be having rubber inside me. Rubber is heavily cross-linked. 
but we can do that. If you want to do it, please go ahead. We can do it. Okay, so uh, let's go and talk about salt. Next one, please. Yeah, oh, sorry. Negative one, positive. Well, we don't have, I mean, I'll, uh, you obviously you are an expert in elasticity. The, the Poisson ratio for these gels is quarter, one quarter. Okay, so this is a down in equilibrium. This is again, a very important concept. It's also easy. This is known for more than a century and particularly for practical applications, you know, uh, reverse osmosis, taking sea water and converting it to good water and everything, all those things, we use these principles. But in the context of hydrogels with, with the charged gels, uh, let me go through this uh, derivation very simply. So here is my gel immersed in an electric solution, right? And uh, the polymer concentration here is that number, C or phi. Don't worry about the numbers, just follow the idea. And then I put the salt. To be equilibrated, certain amount of cations and anions are going to be included into the gel. Right, and the other some of some cations and ions are going to be in the bulk, and there are also counterions in here. But they probably nothing, you know, because counterion there's no life. So the electron neutrality would be concentration of the polymer, which are say let's assume it is negatively charged, I believe, right? And the concentration of negatively charged ions, including uh, yeah, the ions from the electrolyte in the gel, right, should be equal to concentration of the positively charged ions in the gel including counter ions, that's the electron neutrality. Outside, the concentrated cation, concentrated anion must be the same. Right. Now, the osmotic pressure is in the simplest way, so looking at activity, correlations, et cetera, which is the simplest of Fantoff law, if you take this, the osmotic pressure of coming from ions, right, in the units like KT, is the ideal gas law, right? This is a concentration of three uh, positive ions in the gel, concentration of free negative ions in the gel, negative uh, minus the concentration in the background, that's a difference in the concentrations will give me the osmotic pressure. So then what I do is, uh, there is a, this is called a, a down in equilibrium. In the down in equilibrium, namely the chemical potentials have to be the same, which is same as saying that C plus times C minus the gel phase is equal to C plus times C minus concentration in the solution phase, mother phase. So we take this condition, put it in, put it in here, put it in there, and then get an expression for uh, C. Next slide, please. And if you do that, what you get is a quadratic equation, very simple quadratic equation. What you see is the concentration of negative ions in the gel phase is that, and similarly, the concentration of positive ions in the gel phase is that, and therefore I can substitute everything and get the osmotic pressure coming from this is down in equilibrium, which turns out a very simple formula, degree of ionization, polymer concentration, and then salt concentration. And again, to emphasize what Ranjini was saying, the degree of ionization changes with conditions, changes with thermal conditions, pH, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are two limits. When there's no salt, I'll have that quantity as a proportional to concentration of the polymer. When I have a high enough salt, it turns out to be, it turns out to be C square, right? Concentration of poly polymer concentration squared divided by salt concentration. In any way, case, put all of them together. Uh, the entropy mixing, elasticity, down in equilibrium. This expression comes out to be the final answer. This is a, such a beautiful formula, right? Very simple, very, very simple, analytically tractable. Very simple, you know, the you know, back of the envelope, you just put the different limits and calculate what happens. I'll show you the consequence of that formula. Next slide, please. Okay, spelling equilibrium. Take that formula, take osmotic pressure to be zero, and since it's a swollen gel, phi is gonna be small, easy to do logarithm, one minus phi is simply, you know, you can do that uh, simple, simple expansion, and you get a very beautiful result. Swelling ratio is one over phi, phi is volume fraction. That is how much the gel swells, the extent of swelling. That can be like a factor of 500, it turns out. Very large swelling right here. One over five could be a very large number. So the gel can swell very enormous amount. And the important thing is to show that it depends on the length of the strand. Length of the strand. 
And then there's a half minus chi, which is our V, remember V effective that we talked about in, in here. And then that chi effective is this, the original, the Flory Huggins chi and the uncharged case, minus degree of ionization, ZP, number of charges per segment, and then C is a salt concentration. This is L cubed, little L cubed, which is volume of the solvents taken. But the important thing by, by take this, go put it back there. What you see is this, additional salt leads to less gel swelling. Okay, for a given degree of ionization, this is salt concentration is high, salt concentration low. When I add salt, the swelling ratio becomes smaller. Makes sense. Add salt, electrostatic is screened, therefore gel would not swell that much. But please notice that we are not talking about small effects. We are talking about 500 fold swelling or 300 fold swelling. You can control that. You can control by salt. Okay, if you want to have soft tofu instead of what we had yesterday, uh, tofu or what paneer, right? Yeah, you can play with that with salt. Please do that. Next one, please. Uh, this is an extremely important uh, um, issue for at least half of us in this population, maybe more. Right. Suppose I take this gel, put it in a liquid, and I stretch it. Same formula that I told. Use the same formula, analytically tractable. Do that. Stretching ratio is lambda, and then osmotic pressure is zero. Swelling ratio is proportional to the square root of lambda. Okay. When I stretch it, this is a positive number. I'm going to stretch it. This is a positive number, right? When I stretch it, this is going to be more. That is one of swelling ratios more. That is swells more means it's going to take water in. So this gel absorbs water during stretching. And this has a tremendous application in terms of sanitary issues, as you know, as most of you know. Right? And you can tinker it. You can tailor it. Procter & Gamble make enormous amount of money using that formula. <laughs> There's not only physiological issues, but also practical applications that are tremendous possibilities by just playing the game with the paper and pencil. Next one, please. Okay, we can also measure, we can calculate the modulus. Easy to do. Again, paper and pencil calculation. Gel elasticity, shear modulus. This is L cubed, little L cubed, volume of the solvent. And the prediction is this, salt to free case, which is not very interesting. Okay, it's proportional to five, you can work it out. High salt limit that we are talking about, again, the same quantity comes, chi plus alpha square by CS. And most importantly, the shear modulus is proportional to phi square, and the slope depends upon these quantities. And you can, you can adjust that slope. Okay, this is a log log plot. The slope is the two here, right? The amplitude, I should have said, the prefactor can be adjusted. The modulus can be adjusted by playing with salt. So we want to have shear modulus be large or small, you can play the game. You can also do same calculation of bulk modulus and various other things. So in principle, what I want to share with you is all of these things work out very nicely and simply, although these problems will look dartingly complex. And that's the kind of message that I want to share with you. That life can, cannot be that punitive. <laughs> life is to live well, right? Next slide, please. We'll talk about dynamics tomorrow. I'm done. Additional questions? I'm done. Topological screening that you talked about. Say it again. Uh, topological screening. Uh, that uh, I could, I'm uh, feeling a little difficult to imagine. Electrical screening, the Coulomb screening, that is easy to, because the other charts play the role. Well, topological screening. Thank you for raising this question, right? So forget about charges. Here is my polymer chain, right? And I have interaction between these monomers. Uh, that's the extra volume interaction, right? That is extra volume interaction. They would, suppose they are repelling, they like, they repel, they'll go away, right? Good solvent limit. Let's say good solvent limit. Now I bring, I increase the polymer concentration. When I do this, 
this will, this will come in here, oops, sorry, this will come in here and intercept the interaction between this and this. I have an interaction between, suppose nobody is around here, you're right, a part of the polymer here, I'm part of that polymer, nobody's in the middle, and in case of content, another polymer chain comes in here, so the interaction between you and me is going to be skin. I may not be even able to see you because the other chain is coming in. Right. So you work this out because I know uh, the I know how to deal with this polymer chain, right? It's one over R correlation. You can work it out. Uh, write the Hamiltonian to it. Another chain comes in here, and then this interaction now is replaced by this interaction is now replaced by interaction between this and this and between this and that. The net extra volume interaction goes up by putting more and more polymer chains in here, but when I label a chain, the interaction between that monomer and that monomer is reduced. This is what we call screening. And the credit goes to my, actually my former mentor, my postdoc advisor by Sam Edwards. We call this to be Edwards screening. In fact, he came up with in 1965, 66, around that time, he came up with this idea that unleashed the modern way of thinking polymer physics using, uh, you know, field theory. Sackle uh, played a major role, uh, verifying his, uh, his idea by doing neutron scattering. Uh, Janning, Janning was the director, and his laboratory established this, and that's how Fairgill got involved in polymer physics. He was unleashed, he was given commission, commission to really figure this out. So that's how this happens, right? And uh, therefore, uh, the, if you work it out, the net interaction would be not delta of R. The rumor V times delta of R. Instead, due to that combination, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, let me write down R. Okay, there's a number here, a forget number, that's what that is. This C E is Edwards screening length. And that is proportional to V that V I told you, uh, polymer concentration square root apart from some free factors. That's how it happens. Okay, now what I did is to do the Edwards screening problem and the electrolyte problem together in a self considered way, that's how the double screening comes about. Oh, back? Well, it's uh, historical because I told you Bragg and William, they did what, you know, metallurgy, right? Alloys, I don't remember the year, 1912, 1916, something like that, right? You know, classical time. They put it on a lattice, Bragg lattice, whatever it is, where they're doing X-ray crystallography, you know, they knew all these things. That's what they did. Florian Huggins just copied that technology and then they spread the polymer and solvent on that lattice. But, they, but whether it's a lattice or off lattice, it's not important here. Not important, but it's a, that's historical in the nature. Right? But the answer, I could, we, we derived off lattice using field theory, we calculate, we get the same answer. Uh, probably I missed your last lecture, probably you discussed this, but oh, okay. um, when you say chemistry and salt, so what are the things that you include in chemistry? In chemistry means, so for example, suppose I take, suppose I take, for example, CH2, CH2 as an example. I keep on doing this. Okay. And I suppose I have suppose I have something like this. Okay, they are different. And as a result, there's a little L I told you is different. Because the way the way the bonds are correlated because if I have a bond like this, the free rotation would be forbidden or reduced in this case compared to that case. 
So that dictates how much the orientation of a local bond, this carbon carbon bond, how much is going to be persisting, which is going to dictate the magnitude of my cone length, segment length. And that's where I call chemical details. That's what I mean. Right. So, so I want to parameterize. Parameterize that in terms of one parameter, the particular value of the parameter I'm going to put in in my uh, understanding of experiment will depend upon what molecules I'm going to be playing with in my laboratory. That's what I mean by chemistry. Similarly, for a given polymer, for example, I take this one, whether my solvent is like this, right, or like that, it's going to be different. Maybe there is a small change, but that's the methyl group. There is a small change, but still it's going to be different. Okay? Therefore, the chi parameter will depend upon the constituents of the various components. That's what I mean by chemistry. Okay, in this uh, scattering experiment, when you said that there is a, a high intensity at low Q uh, for this charged polymer. And uh, so there might be some long range ordering and there is big structure in that. And you said that with this salt, whether some organic, inorganic salts, right? Sodium chloride or whatever kind of, so that disappears, right? So there are recent experiment when people saw that that peaks becomes more stronger higher you know, sharpness of the peak and so on. So that is done with uh, some organic salt, like you know, this molten salt. So some sort of having small uh, hydrophobic part along with the uh, charged things. So physically, how do you think that this hydrophobic part is playing role in bringing more ordering in the system? Yeah, that's a, there are two parts to your question. It's a very important question, right? I did not talk about complicated systems. This is, a, this is the ground floor. Just wanted to show what the basic rules are. Then we can decorate it with uh, lots of paintings, <laughs> right? So if you put a surfactant, right? And then surfactant has an ability to make a micelle, or if you could do liquid crystals, you know, you can do those things. So they would go and surround these molecules because of the chemistry. And then, then they will modify the organization of those structures. Right, organized for those. The other aspect is, as you talked about, sometimes the intensity goes up. You remember I told you when you add more salts, it will induce phase transition. It's like lowering the temperature. If you undergo the phase transition, then there will be symptoms of high concentration fluctuations in trying to make daughter phases, and that will come as a higher intensity. Right? Then also there's another aspect that I have been talking about so-called, since you are an expert here, uh, upper critical solution behavior, UCSST. Namely, you get a homogeneous phase at higher temperature. At a lower temperature, there's a phase transition, phase separation. Particularly for biological systems, particularly like uh, protein-like systems, it's upside down because of water reorganization and the role of hydro hydrophobicity is a water reorganization, right? So, at, uh, and then when you increase the temperature, and then it's the exactly opposite behavior will take place, and then you'll have organized structure. It's a counterintuitive, it'll organize that, but it's entropy driven. So it's very complicated in terms of, and then you can put in everything comes in terms of chi parameter. Because once you have this picture, whether it's lower critical solution behavior, or upper critical solution behavior, you can play, you can make predictions once you measure chi. How do you measure chi? All of us, me, other people, measure chi using scattering. How do you use? How do you, how do you, what technology we use? You go back more than 100 years ago, once in Zeneca, they looked at the turbidity of the, you know, liquid, use the same technology, use it, make scattering intensity as different wave vectors, scattering wave vectors, and then extrapolate it and you get. So, so like physical intake is that like, you know, if I take your answer in one word, this is like a physical organization of this hydrophobic part. That's what you are saying that yeah. making the story other way around? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. 